Psalm chapter 45. For the choir director, a love song to be sung to the tune, Lilies, a psalm of the descendants of Korah. Beautiful words stir my heart. I will recite a lovely poem about the king, for my tongue is like the pen of a skillful po poet. You are the most handsome of all. Gracious words stream from your lips. God himself has blessed you forever. Put on your sword, O mighty warrior. You are so glorious, so majestic. In your majesty, ride out to victory, defending truth, humility, and justice. Go forth to perform awe-inspiring deeds. Your arrows are sharp, piercing your enemies' hearts. The nations fall beneath your feet. Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. You rule with a scepter of justice. Your, you love justice and hate evil. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than on anyone else. Myrrh, aloes, and cassia performs, perfume your robes. In ivory palaces, the music of strings entertain you. King's daughters are among your noble women. At your right side stands the queen, wearing jewelry of finest gold from, from Ophir. Listen to me, O royal daughter. Take to heart what I say. Forget your people and your family far away, for your royal husband delights in your beauty. Honor him, for he is your lord. The princess of Tyre will shower you with gifts. The, wealth, the wealthy will beg your favor. The bride, a princess, looks glorious in her golden gown. In her beautiful robes, she is led to the king, accompanied by her bridesmaids. What a joyful and enthusiastic procession as they enter the king's palace. Your sons will become kings like their father. You will make them rulers over many lands. I will bring honor to your name in every generation. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. Jesus replied, The most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel. The Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Hi, my name is Cynthia, and I'm a child of God, and I'm here to share with you the gospel, which is the good news. What is the good news? It's that Jesus, who is God, left his throne in heaven, and he was born a very humble birth here on earth. He left his throne in heaven and he was born in the flesh. He grew up and he lived a perfect, sinless life. He was crucified on the cross for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. He ascended into heaven and he's coming back for us very soon in a pre-tribulation rapture. We are all sinners. We cannot save ourselves, so we needed a savior, someone who was without sin. Jesus was without sin. He never sinned. He fulfilled the law of Moses. And so he was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. We have a debt to pay, and that debt is sin. We owe uh, a debt of death because of our sin. Jesus didn't owe that debt, so he was able to pay it for us. If you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and in him alone, you will be saved. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. Hi. It is Mother's Day, and I want to say Happy Mother's Day to everyone out there. Um, to all the moms. Um 
Happy Mother's Day to you. Um, we're going to take uh, some time and we're going to talk about love. They say that there is no love like a mother for her child. Let's look at what love is and let's look at what the Bible tells us about love. I think it would be a, a wonderful Bible study to have on this Mother's Day Sunday. Um, before we go any further, I just want to, okay, so I might be bragging a little bit, I don't know, but I just wanted to show you um, we're living in the last days and I am ready for the rapture at any moment. And how cool would it be if the rapture happened and all our clothes are just left behind as we were wearing them um, for the unbelievers to find our Christian t our Christian shirts. I have several, but this is one of my newer ones. So I'm just going to real quick show you what this one says. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And, um... I wanted to put it just boldly out there. So, repent. That is the only way that you can be saved. You have to repent. You have to change your mind about um, who you thought, how you thought you would get to heaven. You have to change your mind about your, you know, your worldly views. And you have to look at Jesus and put your faith and your trust in him and him alone. So, Happy Mother's Day again, um, this blessed Sunday. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice, and I will be glad in it, even though I have to work today. Um, God calls us to, um, to serve and to... Um, well, God calls us to serve, and His will be done. So, love can be a challenge to define at the level of how a person experiences it. Love can involve personal affection, sexual attraction, platonic admiration, brotherly or loyalty, brotherly loyalty, um, benevolent concern, or worshipful adoration. To accurately answer the question, what is love, we need to go to the origin of love. The Bible tells us that love originates in God. In the English language, the word love is forced to bear the burden of a multitude of meanings. We love everything from pancakes to our parents, but in vastly different ways. The language um, in which the Bible was written, Hebrew and Greek, are more precise in that they utilize different words for the different types of love. The ancient languages differentiate among sexual, brotherly, and familiar um, love, and also the kind of love that God has for creation and that we may have for him. The Hebrew word yada, Y-A-D-A, and the Greek word eros, E-R-O-S, are the words used to indicate sexual love. In Genesis 38, Judah makes love with a woman he assumes is a prostitute. In the original Hebrew of verse 26, the word yada, meaning to know, and in this context, to know carnally or to have sexual intercourse with. In the New Testament, the Greek word eros is not found because there is no context in which it might be used. The second type of love is the brotherly love that exists between close friends, regardless of gender. There is no sexual connotation. It is the love for and by a friend. The Hebrew word is ahaba, A-H-A-B-A-H. -A -A -H. And it is used to describe the love between David and Jonathan in 1 Samuel 20, 17. The Greek word for brotherly love or affection is philio, as used to refer to friendship in John 15, 19, and Romans 12, 10, and Hebrews 13, verse 1. Of family or tribal love, the Hebrew word is once again abba, A-H-A-B-A-H, -A 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 indicating a deep affection, and the Greek word is storage, 
S-T-O-R-G-E. We find Ahaba throughout the Old Testament because of its broad range of meanings. But the Greek word storge is only found in the New Testament as a negative word, estorgos, meaning without natural love, 2 Timothy 3, verse 3. Finally, there is the Hebrew word chesed, 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 C-H-E-S-E-D, and the Greek word agape, which are used to express the kind of love God demonstrates towards his elect. Chesed is often translated as steadfast love or loving kindness. A good example of chesed is found in Numbers 14, 18. Could be pronounced chesed, um, but it's C-H-E-S-E-D. And it's found in Numbers 14, verse 18. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. God, he said love is why he never gives up on those he has adopted as his children, like me, a child of God, and you, children of God. If you have Jesus Christ as your Savior and the Spirit living within you, you are a child of God. I very recently um, broke a tooth. Not anything I can do about that, unfortunately. Um, but soon I'll have my glorified body. And it's getting, it's interesting learning, um, finding that now I have a little bit of a lisp when it comes to certain words. So I'm doing my best here. I hope this doesn't bother anyone. But um, throughout the Old Testament, God's people repeatedly fell into idolatry and sin, yet he always preserves a remnant. He never gives up on his people. And the reason is because of his love, his, he said, love. A similar idea is found in the New Testament with the Greek word agape. That's one that most of us know. Agape love is the goodwill and benevolence of God shown in self-sacrifice and an unconditional commitment to the loved one. Agape is similar to um, Kisad or Chisad in that it is steadfast regardless of circumstance. Agape love is the kind of love we are to have for God in fulfillment of the greatest commandment of Matthew 22, 37. Jesus wants to install Agape in his followers as we serve others through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the most basic sense, love is the emotion felt and actions performed by someone concerned for the well-being of another person. Love involves affection, compassion, care, and self-sacrifice. Love originates in the triune Godhead, within the eternal relationship that exists among the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 1 John 4, 7-8 Loving is unique to the human experience of being an image bearer of God. A pet owner may love her dog. She is concerned for its well-being and cares for it. On the other hand, her dog doesn't truly love her. Oh, it wags its tail, sits by her, and comes when she calls. But all of those responses are based on the fact that she feeds it and keeps it warm. Animals cannot love in the same way that humans created in God's image can love. Um, and many may want to argue with that, um, because I got to tell you, my, um, my dogs are very, um, adorable, loving, affectionate, but it's, it's a different love than what God has created humans to have the capability of love. So here's the bottom line. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We love because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 9 through 11 and verse 19. In um, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, Paul summarizes the essence of the Christian life. The pursuit of faith, 
hope, and love. But now faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And we are going to be looking at um, 1 Corinthians 13, of course, in its totality in a little bit. But um, the first two concepts of faith and hope. Faith is a mix of three elements. Knowledge that comes from the word of Christ found in the Bible. A decision to accept as true and obey those words. The ongoing experience of joy, perseverance, confidence based on our knowledge, belief, and obedience of Christ's words. Hope is an experience produced by faith. It was the absolute certainty that we will receive what God has promised us because God guarantees it. He has already given it to us in Christ. Um, and now I want to review some of the reasons why Paul says that love is greater than faith or hope. We're going to talk about love today. In the Eng English language, the word love is an all-purpose kind of word that describes the various levels of fondness that we have for different things, like I love my dog, or I love the sport of football, or I love my mother. You will note that the same word love is used to describe how one feels about very different things. The New Testament was written in the Greek language, and the Greeks, unlike the English, had a variety of words to express different feelings of love. For example, phili filio, P-H-I-L-E-O. This was the common word for love or affection, and the various words that come from this word shows this. Um, love for a friend, a kiss, a love of knowledge. Philadelphia, a love of brother. Philoxenia, a love of strangers or hospitality. It was a word that denoted the attraction of people to one another in a non-sexual way. This word also served to express a fondness for things and a concern for hospitality, but was not a word used in religious context. Stergo. The word stergo was used to describe the affection between parents and children. At times it served to describe the love that the nation had for its ruler, and on occasion was put into use as a way to describe the affection that a dog had for its master. It was, however, rarely used in the New Testament. Eros, E-R-O-S. The word eros denoted the craving and sensual longing between the sexes. It was the word the Greeks used when describing the state of ecstasy that leaves behind all will, reason, and discretion. Um, the Greek god of love bore the same name. Much of the sexuality in pagan religion was based on the idea that one could commune with the gods when reaching a state of sexual ecstasy. This is what the pagan orgy and practice of sex with temple prostitutes was all about. The word eros also referred to the pleasure one experienced from the arts and sports, etc. But agape, in ancient Greek literature, this word was used infrequently. Only one reference is found outside the Bible. It meant to welcome or to be generous with. It was used to describe the attitude that parents would have with an only child. Like many other ideas, the Bible writers took this rather bland and obscure word and injected it with a very special meaning to describe God's attitude toward us, and then in time, our attitude toward God and other people. In the New Testament, therefore, when we see the word love, it is almost always the English translation of the Greek word agape that the writers chose to describe Christian love because it was different from um, than filio, ster, uh, stergo, or eros. eros. Um, Paul urged the church to pursue faith, hope, and love, but then says that love is the greatest. So why would love be the greatest? After all, without faith, we cannot be saved. And without hope, we would be miserable. Why then would Paul say that love is the greatest? So let's look at some reasons why he would claim this. Um, first off, love is a godly quality. Love is something that existed before faith or hope. It is part of God's nature. 
The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 1 John 4, 8. God does not need faith because his word is truth. John 17, 17. Man needs faith because, um, man needs faith, but God does not because he already knows everything. Man lives on hope because hope supports his yearning to be out of his sinful body and be with God. Romans 8, 24 through 25. But God is not hopeful. He is the one who possesses everything, who gives everything, who guarantees everything. He does not need hope to sustain himself. Faith and hope are things that God has provided for man to save and sustain him. Love, however, is a characteristic that belongs to God and was present long before there was any need for faith or hope. It is greater because, like God, it is eternal in nature. Love is powerful. What moved God to create the world? What moved God to save the world? What moved Jesus to die for his friends? Hmm. Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. And one of the things that really catches my attention here is that Jesus calls us friends. And he laid down his life for us because we are his friends. It is this agape type of love that is different from friendship, though, um, from family or from sexual love. Love has power because power is needed to treat others in a way that blesses only them and not self. Power is required to bestow favor on one who is unworthy of it or to love those who do not love you or are not appealing to you. Only something powerful can move a person to sacrifice self for someone else and care for those who can give nothing in return. Love is greater than faith or hope because love has the power to create, regenerate, and sustain not only the one who expresses it, but the one who receives it as well. Yeah, we are saved by faith and sustained by hope, but that salvation would not have been possible if God had not loved us first. 1 John 4, 19. Love produces light. In John 13, 35, Jesus said, By this all men will know that you're my disciples, if you have love, agape, for one another. The love we have, first and foremost, for one another as Christians, will be the initial light that will display Christ to the world. People are not won over by our great faith or our confidence. They are drawn by the love that they see Christians sharing in the church. And then as they experience it themselves, people who see us helping each other, supporting each other, and sacrificing for one another are drawn to the love that they see in us. Love is the greatest because it is the thing in this world that most resembles represents and reflects the true God and his very real presence in the world. When Jesus talks about light and salt in Matthew 5, 14, he is not referring to faith or hope. He is describing to the, um, the, ex the effects of love. The power of the gospel is not simply religious information about Christianity. It is the love story about Jesus dying for sinners like you and me. The power of our Christian life is not about how much we believe or how convincing we can be in a religious argument. It's not about being right. It's about the witness of our loving attitude toward one another in Christ and our love for those who have not yet known Christ. The power of the gospel brings people to Christ, but it is the light of our love that makes them love the Lord and each other as well. So what is love? In the world, love is about feelings, feeling close and secure to parents and family, feeling intimacy and trust with friends, feeling concern and appreciation for things of beauty, strangers, the nation, a cause, or a feeling of sexual passion. The Bible does not condemn these feelings. They are a natural part of the human experience. But when the Bible talks about love, it talks about something that goes beyond feelings. That is why it uses a special word to describe love. 
In the Bible, love is a characteristic of God, a generosity, a graciousness, a kindness, not based on feelings, but on principle. A holy and perfect God is kind, generous, and welcoming. A creative power. Love based on feelings, um, on feeling takes um, needs and searches for satisfaction. Biblical love empowers others to life, um, to love, and to joy. It's also a bright light. Human love eventually fades because of death or loss of interest. Biblical love becomes brighter and brighter because the source that powers it in our hearts is God himself. To make sure that we would not misunderstand this greatest of all things, God demonstrated this love in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus, as human, experienced all of the feelings of human love, but because he was God, he also demonstrated agape love for all to see. We witnessed this love in his godly character, in his holiness, purity, and knowledge, his creative power in miracles, and bright light of his mercy, kindness, and his sacrifice on the cross. If God is love and Jesus is God, then Jesus is love. When I see Jesus, I not only see the Father, but I see what love is as well. Love is a beautiful word in any language. Some say that there is no love like the love of a mother for her children. But there's a love even greater than that. And that's the love of God. Greater than, I mean, if you're a mother, you know how much you love your children. And you can't even imagine how much more pure, pure love from God is. How, how much more he loves us than we love our own children. On Mother's Day, everyone's going to be celebrating the love of, the, of their mothers or the love for their children. And if you're a single dad, your day is coming. This isn't your, your day. You're, if you're a single father, you're a father. You're not a mother. You're a father. And your day is, um, there's a day appointed to celebrate the love of the fathers. And guess what? Again. The love of God is much greater than the love of a mother or a father for their children. You can't even imagine how much God loves you. And every day is God's day. Every day is a day to praise and worship our Father in heaven, Jesus Christ, who came down onto this earth and died for us. There's no greater love than that. What does it bring to your mind when you think about love? Affection, care, warmth, kindness, understanding, um, security. But think for yourself, what does this beautiful word really mean? Do you want to be loved? Or do you love? God is love and his love abiding in your heart can help you love and be loved. The source of all love is God. 1 John 4, 16 reads, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. No one will ever be truly successful in finding or experiencing love unless he seeks it in and through God. Some of the opposites of love are hatred, mistrust, selfishness, and war. We need only look at many of the conditions prevailing in the world and in many families to understand that there is a desperate need for love. And how about you? Do you feel that you are loved? Do you feel an ache in your heart, a loneliness that will not go away because you feel no affection, no warmth? Do you at times feel that no one really cares? Have you grown up with parents who did not really love each other or their children? 
these feelings are common in today's world where the prevailing attitude seems to be me first. An aching heart is the result of an individual indulging in his own selfish interests. Love is not a sensual attraction that seeks to gratify its own passion, often at the expense of the other person. This attraction, which some may call love, is selfishness because it seeks its own enjoyment. Love does not promote one's own honor or pleasure. The difficult thing that life brings us, um, the, difficult, the difficult things that life brings us are not an indication that God does not love us. God at times allows us to experience difficulty for our good. A parent with true love does not always give a child what he wants, but rather restrains him for the child's benefit. Love is self-sacrificing. True love seeks the good of others. Love is warm, sympathetic, kind. If we really love, we will care for the present and future well-being of those near to us. A loving husband and father will display his affection for his wife and children. He will gladly give and sacrifice of himself to provide an atmosphere of love and well-being. A wife and mother who truly loves will respect her husband and will instill in her children a sense of respect and love for their parents and for each other. She will gladly provide a haven of security and tranquility for all in the family. Christ exemplified love by his undeserved death on the cross. If you feel the need of love, if there's an emptiness in your heart, you can find true love. You can find this by giving yourself to God. God loves you with a tender, caring compassion that knows no bounds. He cares for you and wants to share and help you through all the heartaches of life. If you feel alone and think that no one really cares, you can rest assured that the one who gave his son for you does feel all your heartache and grief. In your loneliest hours and your most dismal days, he will be there to give you comfort, strength, and direction if you turn to him. If you do not know how to reach God, just pour out your heart to him and he will hear you. If you feel you can hardly trust anyone, not even God, tell him so. Then ask him to show you the way. If you feel you are a sinner without hope or ever finding forgiveness and love, come to God with your heart, repenting of and leaving your past sins. He will be your loving father if you come to him with all your heart and are willing to obey in all that he asks of you. When God forgives and accepts you, you will feel his love and gain a relationship with him that nothing can take away. This relationship will only be broken if we turn away from him. As you come to know the love of God and lose your love of self, you will find security. The security of knowing you are loved opens your heart to really care about others. You will no longer be so concerned about how people treat you. You will find that you are concerned about the needs of your fellow men um, and that you have a keen desire to be of service to the God who loves you. When your affections are turned away from self, God will bless you and open your mind to many, many truths. The teaching in 1 Corinthians 13 can help you understand this. When we give ourselves to God, we become a part of his family. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. 1 John 3 verse 1. One way to identify others that are part of this family is by their love for each other. Jesus said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. John thirteen thirty five. This is genuine love, love that cares, shares, and corrects. If you want to know more about love, read the Gospel of John. Read Isaiah 53, where the prophet tells of the sacrifice Jesus would make for us. Read the promises of Psalm 91. Read Psalm 23. Let, let God lead you as you continue reading your Bibles.
There can be an end to your loneliness and unhappiness. Let God take control of your life. Experience God's love. One of the greatest blessings available to man. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8 and verse 13. In the following verses, charity means love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Charity is love. It's, um, and love, as described in 1 Corinthians 13, is best understood as a way of life, lived in imitation of Jesus Christ, that is focused not on oneself, but on the other and his or her good. Love is about action, how a person lives for the Lord and obeys him, and how a person lives for others and serves them. Yet it is also about being. This is because its foundation is in God who is love and in Christ who shows that love. The sense that this is about more than simply how people behave is seen in passages like Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3, 14 through 19, particularly as he prays that Christians will be rooted and grounded in love. To know the love of Christ is to experience his presence through faith in their hearts. God's people are to look and become more and more like Christ. And it is this for, um, for which Paul prays here. It is because being and actions are so closely tied together in God and in Christ first, but then also in his people, that Paul calls love a more excellent way. It is the way of the new age that has been ushered in with the appearance of the Messiah, who has shown it in his life, passion, and death, but who has also exhibited it in his being. Love is the way of existence in the heavenlies. As this breaks into the present in Christ, his people, filled with the Spirit of Christ, are to take on this way of existence and um, develop a life where love guides your approach in all things. Of course, this will immediately be seen in how they live and speak and think. Even so, when all that is mentioned, that is mentioned here is done, the meaning of love for the believer is by no means exhausted. Love is countercultural. Paul's description of the action and behavior produced by love is distinctly countercultural. Um, counter it speaks against the envy, pride, and self-centeredness self -centeredness of the Corinthian Christians, and in doing so speaks clearly to our generation as well. In a society where so much is presented in terms of self, self-awareness, self-esteem, self-acceptance, self-image, self-realization, self-identity. To present a way of existence in which a person lives for the other in a life of loving self-sacrifice will be highly provocative. Following the one who gave his life as a sacrifice for us will be humbling and undoubtedly cost in terms of human recognition and progress in life as secular society defines it. 
Christ has to remain the example. The envy, boasting, rudeness, arrogance, and anger of normal life will be turned upside down. Instead, patience and love and rejoicing in truth are the mark of God's people. In line with the way Christ forgave our sin and no longer holds it against us, so our love is to hold no record of evil. Don't be holding grudges. This is surely one of the easiest ways in which Christians fail properly to handle the times when they are sinned against. They forgive, but the hurt or pain remains at the back of their mind. Then the next time they encounter that person who has wronged them, they remember and keep score. If, some, if something goes wrong again in the relationship, they may once again say, I forgive you, but they will then add the word but. The but usually will hark back to the past and to the record that has been kept of previous hurts committed. We are reminded of Peter's question about how often to forgive his brother when he sins against him. Matthew 18, 21. The answer Jesus gives is that life must be lived as a forgiving life. 70 times 7. Uh, disciples of Christ will go on and on forgiving because it is part of who they are. Love is a most excellent way. Love is not soft. Many see love as little more than an attitude of niceness to everyone. This means that any dispute, any strong speaking over important matters, and any firm spiritual discipling or discipling of another is to be regarded as unloving. In some churches, this has even led to a watered-down Christian faith being preached with little emphasis on holiness, lest some should feel condemned or unloved. We're living in a generation that is offended by everything. The Apostle Paul wrote of the dangers of letting the world's understanding of matters like this influence the church in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. One of the modern myths so prevalent in our society is that love will tolerate all things, promote all things, and deny nothing. In scripture, love is beautiful and well-defined. For It's well-defined for us in that God is love, and Jesus demonstrates this perfectly to us all. The New Testament writers like Paul in this chapter put further down-to-earth flesh on the subject. Certainly love is not soft. It will always seek to build up the other, but that does not mean turning a blind eye to sin or not calling out evil in another person. It does not rejoice at evil. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 6. In fact, true love, since it is supremely seen in the gospel of Jesus Christ, will often divide people, for that is what happens as the gospel is preached and lived out. While Paul can urge patience and insist on kindness, love is patient, love is kind. He sees no contradiction between this and possibly bringing a rod to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 4, 21. He writes, Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or, or shall I come in love and with a gentle spirit? Neither does he see a conflict between God's love and God's severe discipline of his people. Hebrews 12, 6, for example, tells us that the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. It is critical when presenting the love inherent in the gospel of Jesus Christ that it not be reduced to meaningless platitudes and the smiley face of yesteryear. Love is not soft. Love is Christ-like. Love is a way of being as a person, a way of thinking, acting, and living. It is, in fact, being Christ-like. Paul, the author of this letter to the Corinthians, has shown us what this looks like in his own life in chapter 9. For example, he tells them, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. 
To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. He also tells the Corinthians to be imitators of me. Love is the way of being that is so all invasive that it affects the whole of the, of the way of life is conducted. But what is love? The idea of love in contrast with knowledge and grace gifts is introduced earlier in the letter of 1 Corinthians 8. We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. The argument in 8.1 that love builds up reminds the reader that when Paul speaks of building up the church or the body, he thinks of love and action in the community. The focus of love here is um, predominantly the believer of the church, the understood object to build up. In 1 Corinthians 8 verse 3, Paul tells us that God is the object of love. Since Paul rarely talks of love of God, this first deserves, um, deserves comment. It is more characteristic of Paul to describe man's response to God as faith rather than love. Love for God was seen to rest in God's prior work through his spirit. Paul's understanding of the process involved here is most clearly expressed in Romans 5 verse 5. The love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. This is why Paul regards love for God rather than wisdom or knowledge as evidence of having not received the spirit of the world. Rather, we have received the spirit of God. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. The close relationship between love and and the work of the Spirit no doubt provides a partial explanation for why in Paul and in the early church more generally, love is seen as the authenticator um, or marker of a Christian. It is possession by the Spirit of God who pours out God's love into believers' hearts that indicates a person belongs to Christ. Romans 8, 9 through 11 um, this idea also lies behind much. Um, hold on, um, much of the discussion for the next several chapters. For example, First Corinthians fourteen one begins with the imperative pursue love. Before returning to the subject of grace gifts, which must operate in a context of love, he writes: follow the way of love, literally pursue love, and eagerly desire gifts of the spirit. A further explanation of why love comes to function as the marker per excellence of the true believer lies in the imitation of Christ. Christ stands as the supreme example of love through, through the whole of his life, but specifically in his death. In 1 Corinthians 1, the death of Christ was at the center of Paul's understanding of God's wisdom, his plan to save us to save his people. It was the word of the cross that was the power of God to those being saved. Supremely in Christ's death, the love of God and of Christ were shown. The link is explicit in Romans 5, 8. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It is also clear in Ephesians 5, 2, walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Another explanation of why love comes to, authentic, um, to authenticate people of true Christian faith is surely to be found in the way the law is now understood to be written on the hearts of all Christians. Love, focused in two directions, was to be a defining marker of all God's people since the days of the um, Mosaic law. 
The first direction repeatedly stressed is summed up in Deuteronomy 6, 5, with the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and, all your, and with all your might. The second direction is toward the neighbor. Leviticus 19, 18. Jesus repeated this law and even expanded um, its horizons for the disciples in Matthew 5, 43 through 44, with the command to love enemies indeed. Paul talked in Galatians 5, 13 through 14 of the law being fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. None of these explanations need stand alone. Much of the whole biblical theology is based on God and his love for his people and the response of love from his people. As the new covenant people now saw themselves as endued with the Holy Spirit, as having the law on their hearts, and as called to obey Christ, it is not surprising that love develops even more clearly than it had been in the Old Testament into the defining marker of those who truly belong to Christ and follow him. No wonder Paul later speaks of love as the greatest when speaking of those Christian markers that will go forward into all eternity. For Paul then, love for God is inevitably the sure sign that the person is known by God. Perhaps the greatest surprise of chapter 13 is the depth of intimacy of the love relationship um, that Paul described. It is surely more than could have been imagined, especially as Paul looks forward to seeing face to face and writes, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. We shall know God, not in the sense of having the same omniscience as God, but even as he has known us personally with such extraordinary depths of love. The biblical characteristic of love holds a central and paramount position in the Christian faith. Love is not merely an emotion or a fleeting feeling, but a selfless and sacrificial commitment to seek the well-being and welfare of others. The Bible presents love as the highest virtue, embodying the very nature of God himself. So how can we develop the biblical characteristic of love in our own lives? I got a few tips here for you. Number one, seek God's love. Recognize that love originates from God and seek to experience and understand his love for you. 1 John 4.19 says we love because he first loved us. Second, embrace selflessness. Love involves setting aside selfish desires and considering the needs and well-being of others. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 encourages us, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Third, cultivate a compassionate heart. Develop empathy and compassion for others, seeking to understand their struggles and extending kindness and support. Colossians 3.12 teaches us to put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Fourth, practice forgiveness. Forgive others as God has forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32 reminds us, be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Love your enemies. Extend love even to those who may oppose or mistreat you. Jesus teaches in Luke 6, 27 through 28, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Number six would be to serve others. Look for opportunities to serve and meet the practical needs of others. Galatians 5.13 reminds us, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Number seven, speak words of love and encouragement. 
Use your words to build up and edify others. Ephesians 4.29 encourages us, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Number eight, pray for a loving heart. Ask God to transform your heart and fill you with his love. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3.12 says, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. Practice active listening. Be attentive and genuinely listen to others, seeking to understand their thoughts, feelings, and perspectives. James chapter 1 verse 19 advises, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And number 10, reflect God's love to the world. Let your love be a reflection of God's love, shining his light to those around you. 1 John 4.12 says, No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. The biblical characteristic of love is transformative and selfless. Commitment to seek the well-being of others. By seeking God's love, embracing selflessness, cultivating a, a compassionate heart, practicing forgiveness, loving our enemies, serving others, speaking words of love and encouragement, praying for a loving heart, practicing active listening and reflecting God's love to the world, we can develop and embody the love that Christ has shown us. We must strive to love as he loved us, becoming a testimony of his love to a world in need. Um, here's a list of 10 things that people could pray for to develop love, along with corresponding Bible verse. Um, number one, pray for a heart filled with God's love. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Philippians 1, 9. Pray for a selfless, sacrificial love. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. 1 John 3, 16. Number three. Pray for a compassionate and empathetic love. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Colossians 3.12 can be very difficult to do. Pray for a forgiving love, even harder. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4.32 Pray for a love that extends to enemies. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Luke 6, 27. Pray for a love that serves others. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Galatians 5, 13. Pray for a love that speaks truth. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Ephesians 4.15 Pray for a love that rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 1 Corinthians 13.7 And pray for a love that promotes unity. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. And then finally, pray for a love that reflects God's love to others. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. 1 John 4, 7. By praying for a heart filled with God's love, a selfless and sacrificial love, a compassionate and empathetic love, a forgiving love, 
a love that extends to enemies, a love that serves others, a love that speaks truth, and a love that rejoices in the truth, a love that promotes unity, and a love that reflects God's love to others. We can actively seek and develop the biblical characteristics of love through prayer, dependence on God's grace, and a commitment to living out His love in our lives. We can become vessels of His love in a world in need. We must strive as Christ has loved us, seeking to honor and glorify him in all that we do. Love is sincerely desiring God's best for another and doing what I can to see that accomplished. I have found that to be a pretty good summary of biblical love. So here's five things that we can learn from the love from the Bible. Number one, love is the essence of what God requires. When Jesus was asked, what the greatest commandments were, he, ref he referenced two, and they both relate to love. We are called to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we are to love our neighbor. This does not exclude anyone, as we love ourselves. And the assumption is that we do love and take care of ourselves. Um, what is the essence of our calling and purpose in life? To love well the right things. God and others, because God is love. 1 John 4, 8 tells us that the one who does not love God, or the one that, it tells us that the one who does not love does not know God. Corinthians 13, love is patient, kind, not conceited or selfish, forgives, bears all things, etc. We get a glimpse of the character of God. Now, it is not accurate to turn this phrase around and say that love is God and then create a God from our notion of what we think love is. In this scenario, you end up with an idol of your own making, but the truth is that the nature of God is love. Jesus shows us the nature and character of God the Father. Um, look at John 14 verse 9, and Jesus shows us the nature of love. <sighs> We love because God loved us first. Um, look at 1 John 4, 19. We don't have the capacity to love well in our own strength, just as the moon reflects the light of the sun and does not have light in itself, so we too are reflections of God's love. That means we must first be willing to receive the love that God has for us in Christ. Once we receive it, we have the opportunity and command to love others. Love it initiates. God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still rebels against him, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. We love because he first loved us. Love is sacrificial. I mean, how did God demonstrate his love according to Romans 5, 8? At a great cost. The Bible tells us that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. And John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. Love is giving and sacrificial. Most of what we see in pop culture that defines love is conditional. I love you because. I love you if. I love you when. Love in our world is often an emotion and often a selfish one. We love when, some, when someone benefits us. That is not the essence of God's love. Love is a quality, not an emotion. One of the most radical things Jesus taught his followers was to love their enemies. It is difficult to find this teaching in any um, of the great ancient philosophies of or religions. Godly love initiates and is not um, not dependent on the worthiness of the receiver. Love is a characteristic and quality in the hearts of those who follow Jesus and allow his love to flow through them. Many of us love to work, but we must also learn to demonstrate biblical love through our work. In Galatians 5, 19-21, the Apostle Paul describes the works of the flesh. These practices include sexual immorality, impurity, 
sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Notice that in each of these sinful practices, there is disregard for the two greatest commandments that Jesus identifies, love for God and love for our neighbor. The works of the flesh are a result of placing our own desires above those of God and our spouse, family members, colleagues, friends. For example, idolatry is ascribing to something unworthy that rightly belongs to God alone. That would be our worship. Our our worship. Envy is a direct violation of the command to love our neighbor because envy causes us to place our own desires above those of another person. Each of these fleshly works are the result of feeding our fallen nature rather than being led by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is interesting that the first characteristic listed in the fruit of the Spirit is love. In the works of the flesh, there is an absence of love toward God and humanity. In the fruit of the Spirit, everything begins with love. What does this have to do with work? Well, previously, um, I applied Galatians 5.16 to the workplace by saying that we can work by the Spirit and overcome the desires of the flesh. We have all either heard of or experienced work environments with an abundance of anger, rivalries, bitterness, and envy. If the Spirit is not leading our lives, the work of the flesh can become the outcome of our attitudes. I'm not the only one out there today that's going to be working on Mother's Day. How envious might you be seeing, um, like I work as a nurse, and I'm going to be watching family members come to see their their mother. Um, it's a big day where I work as a nurse because all of a sudden all the children are coming to visit their parents. Um, but not me. I'm going to be at work. I'm actually going to be bringing my mom her Mother's Day gift the day before on Saturday because she wants, plans to go to church on Sunday. So yes, at the moment that I'm recording this, it's actually Friday and I will be uploading this on Mother's Day. Um, because I'll be working and I make my videos, as I've told you before, I make these videos on my days off. Um, but I want to just show you something that I haven't even put on Facebook. Um, I have a large 8x10 um, photo framed for my mother, along with other gifts. Um, but this is what I will be bringing. I have a framed 8x10 for her and she's going to love this. Um, but this is um, something that um, we all got together at the park for a very short time, unfortunately, but I was able to get a four generation photo with my, my mother, myself, all three of my children, and all five of my grandchildren. This is an amazing photo that I, I'm so excited to share with my family. So this is what I have put together for my mother. I see there's a bit of a reflection here, but my mother, my three children, myself, and all five of my grandchildren. And she's going to love this. She's actually not on Facebook. She doesn't even have the internet. So she needed prints. And most of the time we don't make prints. Um, so this was very hard. We really tried hard to get this um, photo before Mother's Day. Um, and so we were able to do it. And she's going to be extremely happy and extremely thrilled. Uh, my mother, not too long ago, survived cancer. Um, she had radiation. She's had, she had surgery, full, hysterect his, full hysterectomy. She had um, chemo and like I said, radiation, and she's doing much better today. Um, so it was a very important photo to get um, due to her health issues. Of course, she's not going to be with us forever. And um, she loves her family. She loves all of her children, all four of us. There's four of us. And she loves all of her grandchildren. 
very, very much. And um, these children here, those are her great grandchildren. And these are all of her great grandchildren in what, all at once. So this is going to be a very important um, picture that she's going to be so excited to have. And I'm very anxious to give it to her. Um, at the time that I'm making this video, I've already brought her her gifts. And I, I know she's going to be feel very blessed with it. Um, but I'll be working on Mother's Day. And I'm not the only one. Um, God blesses us and calls us to his service. And he makes time. There's a time for everything. If you... Um, Follow God's God's word, even if you have to work. He made time for you, and we need to make time for Him. That's the most important thing. Is we need to make time for Him. I mean, Paul reminds us that the works of the flesh do not have to be our reality, but rather we can be led by the Holy Spirit, who will produce spiritual fruit in our lives. And the first characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit that Paul mentions is love. To better understand what Paul means by love, we can look at his words on love in 1 Corinthians 13, which come in the context of Paul's discussing, discussing the gifts of the Spirit. He writes, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. How annoying is that, right? 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Without love, our gifts and talents become about us. And this is not proper stewardship. The Lord gives us gifts and talents to glorify him and to serve those he has put in our lives. So there's some practical um, ways that we can love well in our workplaces. We work for the glory of, um, for God's glory, for the glory of God. First, we must love the Lord by doing our work for his glory. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 and Colossians 3, 17. The best way that we can keep our focus off of ourselves and on the Lord is by seeking to exalt him in all that we do. James writes, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder and every vile practice. James 3.16, 3, when our focus is on our own interests, the result is the works of the flesh. In contrast, when we work for the glory of Christ, he will be exalted and his presence will saturate our work. Everything that is done for the glory of God will be done in the spirit of excellence and excellence will breed product productivity and efficiency in the workplace. We must love our co-workers more than ourselves. We know that some colleagues are easier to love than others, um, but this is non-negotiable. -neg when a colleague is promoted, we rejoice with them. When they are hurting, we mourn with them. Romans 12, 14 through 15. Loving our colleagues um, will provide open doors for the gospel, but to love them well, we must get our focus off of ourselves. Furthermore, the success of our colleagues is not something for which to be envious. Rather, their success can be our success. As we work together and mutually serve each other, the level of productivity in the organization will rise because each colleague will be seeking the benefit of others. We don't need to compete with each other. We need to lift each other up. Seek eternal value in our work. Um, that's the third principle, and it's built on the first two. When we love the Lord and our colleagues well, we will be making eternal investments. The Lord has called each of us to advance his kingdom through the work he has given us to do. As we go to work each day, we must be mindful that there are people the Lord is putting in our paths who need to experience the love of Christ, as we have received the love of Christ. So we must give that love to those whom, with whom we come into contact with. Not everyone's going to love you. Not, In fact, you may find yourself blindsided by someone's just pure hatred towards you or just random um, the way they just randomly attack you but remember um, if they persecuted Jesus they will persecute you sometimes it's, it's it's Jesus Christ they see inside of you and some 
hate hate you because you have Christ in you. So don't think it's going to be all roses and um, happiness and joy um, with your fellow with fellow with with other with with non-believers. Um, the bottom line in our jobs is not just dollars and cents, though. It includes souls. Jobs will come and go, but lives changed by the gospel will produce an eternal investment that cannot be stolen by this world. We are, need to be planting those seeds as we work to love. We will find increased fulfillment in our jobs because we will be more aware of the eternal purpose God has placed in our work. And when you keep these things in mind, you feel that peace in your soul, no matter what's happening around you. Um, it is something that is easy to say and nearly impossible to do. Love your enemies. Um, but I hope you can unpack the meaning of those two critical passages that guide us in that area. Matthew 6, 44 and Luke 6, 27. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, we need to seek understanding and present issues and context that brought about that statement from our Lord Jesus to discover the meaning for our lives. What are the real ways that believers can love their enemies? You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. Matthew 6, 43 through 45. In this passage, Jesus is seated before a crowd and teaching the word of God that is being fulfilled in his own person. All the articles of our religion, all the canons of our church, all the injunctions of our princes and all the hom homilies of our fathers, all the body of divinity is in these um, three chapters um, on the ser in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount on a hill north of Galilee has been called a radical reinterpretation of the Old Testament scriptures by Jesus. Um, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, he rejected the easygoing tradition of the scribes, reaffirmed the authority of the New Testament scripture, and drew out the full and exacting implication of God's moral law. So we can say that the presenting issues um, we observe in the text have to do with a misunderstanding of loving one's enemies. This remains a challenge for our generation as well. Now, there was nothing wrong with the Old Testament teaching of recognizing the enemies of God. But the casual, easy interpretation by the Pharisees and the Sadducees led the people of Israel to see all the Gentile nations as prominent and perennial enemies. Hatred of others is a useful tool used by ungodly authorities to create a unity based on rage, roots of bitterness, um, the past sins of others, critical judgment of others. Jesus taught that we who were enemies of God are now called friends of God, children of God, through Jesus Christ. Moreover, those who persecute us today may, in God's grace, become those who protect us tomorrow. Therefore, we are taught by Jesus in the same passages to pray for them. We must always remember St. Paul. He was the persecutor of the believers, the enemy of the saints, who became the great apostle to the Gentiles. Always remember that life in the community of man is not divided into, you know, the Hatfields and McCoys. We are in no permanent position of hatred and enmity with each other because of the love of God in Christ and the transforming power of the gospel, many who curse God today will be preaching his word tomorrow. Many of the mockers and scoffers that, you're coming up, that you come across, the scorners of the word, uh, you're planting those seeds. You know what? They could end up being the um, tribulation saints, the ones who give their lives for Christ in the seven-year tribulation, which is coming very soon. 
we must realize that we too were once enemies of God. The Lord Jesus says that when we love our enemies, we prove that we are his children. Yet his children, that is, you and I are children by holy adoption. God adopted his enemies to be his sons and daughters. Think on what is um, perhaps the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. Read beyond verse 16 to consume the fullness of the meaning. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life, everlasting life. For God not, sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's John three sixteen through 18. God saves because we need saving. If we look upon those who oppose, hurt, or persecute us as irredeemable, unchangeable, um, that are undeserving of our love and our forgiveness, then we must quickly run to the cross. Meditate on the truth that is proclaimed throughout all of the Bible and personified in the person of our Lord. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. The greatest truth is that God pursues those who rebelled against him, that he might bless them. David was a type of this kind of searching love when he returned to Jerusalem. And David said, is there still anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Second Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. We might hate the wicked ways of those around us as they represent an affront to God's holiness. However, those living without Christ are not unreachable. Pray for them. Pray that God will help you to love them and forgive them as you remember how God loved and forgave you. We love our enemies so that we might please the God who loved us. Jesus emphasizes the reality of reward in loving others. In Luke 6, 35-36, it states, But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. The practical implication of this teaching is clear. There is great reward in loving our enemies and forgiving them for their sins against us. Jesus forgives. Um, Jesus forgave those who crucified him. The cross of Christ was transformed from an instrument of shame to a sign of salvation. Such a radical gospel transformation is um, now operating the hypothesis for the people of God. We should not be surprised when unbelievers are converted to Christ. We should not be surprised when they are not. The gospel is like C.S. Lewis Aslan on the move. When faced with the enemies of God, it is best to take those who have hurt us or even persecutors and leave them at the foot of the cross in prayer. To continue hating, resenting, or holding a grudge against another person is to remain on the cross. There is no transformation in such scenarios. There is only greater, um, greater pain. When we follow the rich, life-giving teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, we become spirits set free, free from yesterday's pain, free from the ugliness of sin that stains and affects our relationships, free from the life-crippling burden of unforgiveness. To love as Christ loved us is to receive and share the reward of such love, a new life. There is no reason for you to remain on a painful cross of unlovingness or in the sh um, shame-shrouded tomb of lifelessness. Christ loves you. He forgives you as you come to him. You come down from the cross, out of the tomb, and are like the Lord, renewed to eternal life. And that is not only how to love your enemies, but also why we must love them. There is no other alternative for one who knows such love in one's own life. 
That is why Paul writes, And now abide, faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. So, while you may think that you love someone so fully and so perfectly, you'll never love the way Jesus Christ loved us. You'll never love anyone the way God loves us and love and the way he loves each and every one of us we are children of God called we have a calling to love others and it's a very difficult calling especially when people are cruel to you hurt you scoff at you but God's way is perfect God's love is perfect God is love if you don't know Jesus Christ, you'll never even begin to grasp the concept of Christ, of Christian love. Um, loving your loving your family members is easy. Loving your enemies is very difficult. And we need the Holy Spirit to guide us and protect us and to show us the way. Jesus Christ is love. And Jesus Christ is God. And God is love. We must share that love with the world. We must be a light to the to a very, very dark world. And as hard as it is, God is with us always because we are his children. We are children of God. I am a child of God. And we have a great reward, great, great rewards for us in heaven. We can't even imagine what God has in store for us. But for those who don't know him, It's, it's terrifying to even think about it, even for your enemies. Um, what's coming, if, if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior before you die or before Jesus comes again, they are lost forever. And forever is a very long time. You, we can't even understand how long eternity is. We can't um, because we live in time. So if you don't know Jesus, I implore you, um, beg of you to get to know him and get to know him as soon as possible like now put your faith and your trust in him and him alone because Jesus alone is the way to heaven there's no other way he is our salvation he is our savior and he can save you I want to see you in heaven